This video is sponsored by Nebula. This is Martha Jones. She deserves the world, but seeing as she was a black woman created in 2007, she got, well, what she got. What's your name again? Martha, sir. Martha Jones. Well, tell me then, Jones. Hands like those, how can you tell when something's clean? <laughs> but let's talk about how we got here and back again into Doctor Who. Hi, I'm Princess Weeks. I talk about pop culture and fun stuff and argue about my favorite characters. And we're gonna do that here today with Doctor Who. Doctor Who is a science fiction show that has been airing on the BBC since 1963. It aired for 26 seasons with some gaps in between and then was revived in 2005. The series shares the adventures of a time lord known as the Doctor who travels through time in a device known as a TARDIS, which due to some glitch looks like an old timey British police box. But don't worry, the Doctor is mostly not a cop. So that's good. I took a picture with it when I was in England many, many moons ago. The doctor has the ability to regenerate from one form to another. This will usually happen at a time when the body he is in is too harmed and unable to heal itself. This ability has led 13 different actors to play different incarnations of the doctor, with Jodie Whittaker becoming the first woman to play the role of the doctor. Officially, there is that parody. I think I can see the on switch. No doctor, we have to face facts. You've come back to life, and this time, you're a woman. Really? I've always wanted to get my hands on one of these. The Doctor travels with different people called companions, and each incarnation of the Doctor has their own look, their own vibe, their own variance on the personality, which leads to everyone being able to choose their own Doctor, their favorite companion, their favorite Doctor companion interaction. The 2005 incarnation of the show is often called New Who, but due to the popularity of the show, many of the older seasons are available online, and many fans such as myself have gone back and reintroduced ourselves to a lot of the older characters. Um, I really love Sarah Jane and Ace, so, uh, which, you know, loving Sarah Jane is like a prerequisite for being a Doctor Who fan, in my opinion. In addition to the main show, there were a number of spin-offs, including Torchwood, The Sarah Jane Chronicles, K-9, and something called Class that I had left the fandom long before I ever saw, but, it did exist. The Doctor Who was a huge part of my young adult personality. I met a really good friend of mine online to meet Alex Kingston at Comic-Con because I was obsessed with her and River Song at a, a convention in England. I couldn't afford to meet uh, Matt Smith, but I did manage to meet a very tiny Maisie Williams. There used to be a bar in Prospect Heights, Brooklyn called The Way Station that closed down permanently during the pandemic, but it was a very popular nerdy Doctor Who bar that I would go to with friends from rarely but it did happen because it was the thing about Brooklyn is like no matter where you live it's always going to be far from something else um but I loved when I did go there the Doctor Who themed it had a TARDIS bathroom I'm glad that it's gone like it was just a really great place to go and meet people who also love Doctor Who and as someone whose primary personality is loving lore and arguing about faves it was just a great series for me and I also love any show that has the inability to write good romance, but makes me very invested in the romantic entanglements of its characters. So I was always coming back for more and hoping that, you know, it would learn to be more than just a shonen show. I think I stopped watching at series seven and I haven't gone back since, even though I was interested in Jodi and I was really interested in Peter Capaldi because I'm a big In The Loop fan and like, Peter Capaldi is hot. So I was just like, I was like, <sighs> Uh, and I didn't really touch Doctor Who again until two things happened. Back in 2022, it was announced that Chudi Gatwa would be playing the 15th incarnation of the titular Doctor, becoming the first black actor to lead the show, the fourth Scottish actor to lead the show, and the first actor born outside of the United Kingdom to play the character, which was super exciting. I found Gatwa, like many others, through sex education. He's beautiful, he's fabulous, he's queer. I want everything for him. And the other big news was that it was announced 
announced that Magic the Gathering would be doing a crossover with the franchise, incorporating different cards and designs throughout the entire run of Doctor Who. Some of you may know this, some of you may not, but I love Magic the Gathering. It has become my adult play date activity. Uh, it is how I've made some of my greatest connections right now in my uh, early 30s. So it's really, uh, this was like two of my worlds and personalities colliding in a very intense way. And since then I've been uh, back on my bullshit. Earlier this year at Magic the Gathering convention in Barcelona, they were unveiled a bunch of the new cards and I was just so blown away by like the detail and the accessibility of it, but also that the cards are good. You know, one of the things that every Magic the Gathering fan talks about is sort of like, do the cards in these different expansions work playably? And so many of them are really fun. I especially love the River Song card because obviously i love the idea of playing your deck um going from the bottom of your deck i love that the ability is called spoilers um it is is it which you know troubling but <laughs> you know i would have loved aristocrats but you know you get what you get so this is the time you wind me deck this deck uh, is all about uh, time counters. It's a theme we've never done before in a commander deck, but made a lot of sense for Doctor Who. And just more exciting news kept on coming. Russell T Davies, who was responsible for the first Doctor Who revival, would also be returning as the showrunner. Uh, David Tennant would be returning as the 14th Doctor, and Catherine Tate would be returning as Donna Noble, one of my favorite companions. And it made me go back and revisit the series that I watched and loved. And when I went back to revisit all that stuff, that's when this became a video essay and not just me fangirling, especially because considering that we are filming this during the writers and acting strike, I wanted to really make sure that if I cover Doctor Who, it was gonna be a personal retrospective with something to say and not just glee. Because while I have a lot of glee about Doctor Who, rightfully so, there is a lot of bullshit that, uh needs to be brought to the table. So let's talk about it. I got into Doctor Who during the notorious era known as Super Who Lock. Dark times, horrible times, racist times like let's just call it what it was it was like if you were into those fandoms and you really liked it it was great if you were like a little bit critical a little too like not the fun kind of queer a woman and a minority who cared about representation you were lost of those three franchises in that Thing, which was Supernatural, Doctor Who, and Sherlock, the BBC version. Doctor Who was the only one I was into. I was a fan of Elementary, okay? During the great Elementary v. Sherlock Wars. And if uh, my annual watching of the H-Bomber video has taught me anything, I made the absolute correct choice. If you actually want to understand what is happening in the story, Stephen Moffat calls you a stupid piece of shit. Although Tessa, if you're watching, I will eventually watch BBC Sherlock to form a unbiased opinion, but my biased opinion is that I was right. My older sister was a fan of Doctor Who and showed me the episodes Blink and Journey's End. Two very traumatic and upsetting episodes for very different reasons. The Weeping Angels were terrifying. <laughs> A few years later, right as Matt Smith's incarnation wrapped up its fifth series, I decided I was gonna go back and start watching Doctor Who all the way from series one, where the Doctor was first played by Christopher Eccleston. And again, this is the new Who era, which is everything that was made from 2005 up. It is its own continuity. Uh, so the doctor was played by Christopher Eccleston and his companion was Rose Tyler played by Billy Piper, sir. The first part of the series of the Doctor Who revival is very Rose and doctor centric. And if you're into that, that's great. If you're not, it's horrendous. <laughs> and for the record, despite everything, I really do like Billy Piper, she's excellent in Penny Dreadful, she's excellent in other things. I do fancy Billy Piper, sir. So. She fancy Billy Piper, sir. Right. <laughs> and even though Matt Smith is my doctor, AKA the first doctor I ever watched a full series of the show with, my favorite 
from the series that I have watched is absolutely nine. There's just something about Eccleston's personality, the slightly jaded midlife crisis vibe that's embedded within the character that just works. He has the ability to be both very like grounded and real and kind and funny, but because he has like a, just goofy facial expressions that are really fun and just says these things and delivers them in just a way that you're just like, that was so fucking good. Like the banana line lives rent free in my brain. Go grab the banana. Why not? Good source of potassium. But there's also this darkness that Eccleston can tap into because he's an accomplished actor. And then you also have episodes like The Empty Child and The Doctor Dances that really highlight the bonds that the doctor has made with humanity. So that like even as someone who at that point had only ever watched so little Doctor Who, his series was a great entry point because it really tells you everything you need to know with an actor who can really carry the weight of someone who you think has been around for a really really long time but is still trying to hold on to something to the possibility of new life and i think that his doctor really gets to do that everybody lives rose just this once everybody lives then we get series two with David Tennant taking over as the 10th incarnation of the doctor. And he and Rose are like constantly smelling each other's farts all season. They clearly, like even though the relationship between Nine and Rose was romantic, because, you know, Tennant is younger, slimmer, you know, has the whole kind of like hot twing vibe. They, they kind of up it even more. I, as I, I was realizing as I was writing the script that like, 10 kind of has 2000s era Timothy Chalamet energy, which is like <laughs> horrible to speak into existence. But if you search your feelings, you know it to be true. Like the feeling that like really pretentious Timothy Chalamet fans felt watching him and Kylie Jenner at the Beyonce concert or the US Open is how I felt every time I saw Rose and 10 together. Like I appreciate Rose as this working class, character who is plucked out into adventure. I think that what I like about Davies's version of companions is that they are regular people called to action, hero's journey, and they change and evolve through the interaction with the doctor for the better. That's really fun, that's really engaging. I just feel like their dynamic is just a lot. Like again, if you're into Rose and 10, then series two is a great season for you. If you don't like them, you know, the episodes aren't that great either. Uh, but there is the girl in the fireplace, a Stephen Moffat episode who will become the next official showrunner for Doctor Who. That was excellent at the time, but like Bitcoin will only depreciate in value until it is practically worthless. I hate that I can actually make decent like Bitcoin references now because I know what all these ridiculous coins are like I'm too old to know these things I don't I shouldn't know series two ends with Rose and 10 being separated into these two parallel dimensions like Rose ends up in a dimension where like her dead father is alive her mom is cool like she's gonna have all this happy stuff but she's gonna have her her love um and it's very emotional even as a hater the finale of series two is very good. You know, I'm a hater, but I'm not Delulu, so I can say it was good. But now Rose is going to leave the show. Who do you get to replace the girl that the doctor loved? The girl that the doctor doesn't. Ready? No. Martha Jones, played by Frema Agamon, is, first of all, let me just say, Frema gets screwed over by every show she's ever been on besides maybe Sense8. She deserves the world. I love her. I hope you get your paper and you hope you get your checks. You deserve the world. You're amazing. Martha is notable for being the first black female companion and the first black full-time companion. I will explain why I make that qualifier later but because Martha was going to be a first black anything it meant that her arrival was always going to be very heavily discussed by fans for better and absolutely for the worse I always love to go as a new fan or something going to message boards and find out what like people are thinking and before I even watched any of her series when I would go on the message boards 
All I would see was tons and tons of Martha hate, that her, her season was awful, her season was terrible. Martha is a foil to Rose in a lot of ways. When she appears in Doctor Who, she is a medical student trained to become a doctor. She's from a more middle class family. She's ambitious, you know, she's really, going in a direction and on her own journey when the doctor comes in and this sort of writing of having a character who's a minority but in a elevated place of class and authority is something that you'll see happen a lot in genre shows in order to have like a black or brown character who is not going to be stare not to be a stereotype their characterization is elevated in terms of their class and that is supposed to be able to skirt through all of the usually class related stereotypes that come with being a person of color. It does not make up for the fact that she is written in the series as the replacement. Her story and her legacy is very largely remembered and defined, especially by those who do not like her and didn't want to like her to begin with, as falling in love with and winning over the doctor for her entire series. Well, you're the one that kissed me. That was a genetic transfer. And if you will wear a tight suit. Now, don't. And then travel all the way across the universe just to ask me on a date. Stop it. For the record, I'm not remotely interested. I only go for humans. Good. Ellen, go down the river to get on eyes. And there's nothing I can do for her now. Martha's still a very capable character, but that element of her story is very much at the forefront. There are episodes in the show that explicitly deal with Martha and her race in universe. The Shakespeare Code and the two parters of the family of blood, which is human nature and the family of blood. Both are set in the past. Um, Shakespeare Code is obviously, as the title says, set in the Shakespearean era, and the latter is set in the 1913 pre-World War One era. So if we start with the Shakespeare Code, it's interesting because Martha is meant to be going on her only trip with the doctor when she goes into Shakespeare stuff. And when she goes out, she asks if she's gonna be okay walking around the time period being a black person and Ted is just kind of like yeah girl just walk around just be just just do what I do I walk around all the time oh but hold on am I all right I'm not gonna get cut off as a slave am I why would they do that I'm not exactly white in case you haven't noticed I'm not even human just walk about like you in the place it works for me are you dumb? Tenna's overall pretty flippant about her concerns and even Shakespeare's inability to know what to call her, like racially, is played for laughs. What to the point, who is your delicious black and white lady? What did you say? Oops, isn't that a word we use nowadays? An Ethiop girl, a suave, a queen of Africa. I can't believe it. It's me. Political correctness gone mad. And I honestly wouldn't hate those moments if it wasn't for what comes next in like the Family of Blood episodes, because yes, the Elizabethan era of London absolutely had free black people in it. Like black people were absolutely invented then. That is a fact. And I think that using a show like Doctor Who, which is a family show and using it as a way to highlight how multicultural the past in certain places and pockets have been is really important. The problem is what it shows about 10 as the person who we trust to take us through this journey. He doesn't really try to understand Martha's concerns. Like there's a there's an empathy chip missing in this regard. And his disregard for Martha's racial safety becomes deeper in human nature and the family of blood, where he literally puts her in a situation where she has to deal with very horrible racism, arbitrarily almost, because it doesn't need to be in the Edwardian era, at least not for any reason I can see. And before you say that this is just me being woke or whatever, I just, to me it's not about being woke. I just personally feel that since in canon, the doctor is a time lord, been around for hundreds of years. He, you know, they are a refugee and a survivor of a genocide. And his greatest foes are literally ethnic cleansing, evil salt and pepper shakers, okay? We should be able to say or assume that despite the fact that he may present as white and present as male sometimes, that the character would have more understanding of these anxieties. 
or at least that's what I think. I think nine would get it personally. Human nature and the family of blood open with the knowledge that the doctor and Martha are being hunted by beings who will never stop chasing after the doctor because they long for the lifetime of a Time Lord, which is near immortality. They're following us. They can follow us wherever we go. Right across the universe. They're never gonna stop. And in order to stop them, to kind of shake them off their tail, the doctor decides that he's gonna trick himself into presenting as human. And so 10 becomes John Smith, a professor in this preppy boarding school in Edwardian England. And Martha is a maid and has to deal with racism explicitly and sexism from not just the students, the boy students and other members of staff, but also John Smith himself. So the doctor couldn't even invent a preset version of himself that was like a little bit less racially toxic. You're coming back to the TARDIS with me. How dare, how dare you? I'm not going anywhere with an insane servant. Martha, you are dismissed. Leave these premises immediately. Now get out. And not only is her affection for the doctor unrequited, but despite that, Ten actively plays into it. Like all companions on the show due to the nature of alien and human elements of the doctor have to do some amount of emotional labor for the doctor. Now to go back a little bit, when Martha is introduced in the episode Smith and Jones, the doctor kisses Martha. So her feelings for him don't come out of thin air. Shout out to Aladdin and the King of Thieves. Martha, stay here, I need time, you've got to hold them up. How do I do that? Just forgive me for this, it could save a thousand lives, it means nothing, honestly nothing. A moment that very much leads to her being attended to the doctor. He is this charismatic guy who just comes whirlwindly can show her that like I can take you anywhere through space and time girl. I got powers that you just understand. That's very intriguing. You know, most guys only have a podcast. He got a whole time machine. And he's very much aware of this in my opinion, but he's still in love with Rose, which again, Rose was taken from him in a very traumatic way. It doesn't excuse his behavior, but in these two parters, he literally falls in love with a random white woman who is also a racist nurse. And more than that, I don't just follow him around. I'm training to be a doctor, not an alien doctor, a proper doctor, a doctor of medicine. Well, that certainly is nonsense. Uh, women might train to be doctors, but hardly this could be, and hardly one of your color. Well, what's the reason? There is this trope called the disposable black love interest and essentially means black characters who are brought into a show and set up as like really good partners for a main character, but are ultimately a building block between the main character and their actual love interest, who is usually a white person. And while black tends to be the biggest one in terms of just like demographics, this can happen to any character of color. Some popular examples I can think of are Jimmy Olsen from Supergirl, Dolls from Winona Earp, Val and Danny Phantom, Dean Thomas and Cho Chang from the Turf books, and funny enough, uh, Mickey from Doctor Who. Yeah, I can't. I've, um, I've got to go and find my mom and Someone's got to look after this stupid lumps. Yeah, we're gonna talk about Mickey, a character that does suck, but uh, was written to do so. So we have to kind of explain what that is. Mickey Smith is the boyfriend of Rose Tyler, who was created to be the guy, to quote Davies, who deserved to lose his girlfriend. And this is shown by Mickey being kind of sketchy, telling Rose not to go look at his phone at one point and ignoring Rose to go at the pub. This is all done to kind of make Mickey this lazy, cowardly, bad, like in the first series, he's literally just like, he's kind of a bad guy. That lot good you were. <laughs> He is essentially the disposable black male love interest. He is not good enough for Rose. And uh, Davies even says, quote, some people think that Rose treated Mickey badly, like she was the selfish one. But would you look at that line? He's referring to a line where Mickey tells Rose not to look at his emails. What on earth do you think that line means? Seriously, that boy deserved to lose his girlfriend right from the start. This is the thing with a lot of white writers that want to do diversity 
have positive intent, but don't actually think things through. Like, what do you think it looks like to have an interracial relationship where the guy is further dragging down the white female character and then a white man comes? and has all of this uh, accessibility to other things, other worlds, and just swoops her away. And in many ways, I get it because Davies likes writing characters, he says, that are naturally selfish. And he wanted to make Mickey selfish in order to show that Rose had things that she had to leave behind, you know, that he abandons her to go to the pub to watch football before Rose abandons him to go like follow this white man into space and time. And like, I understand because yes, leave that man. But also I think a lot of creators want the optics of diversity, but don't actually think about tropes and history and how you play into certain stereotypes without meaning to, especially when it comes to who is shown to be worthy of love, who has the ability to be lovable. And also like to have a, a, a depiction of, of Mickey, you know, the first black companion, if you just want to talk, even though he's only part time, the first black male companion in Doctor Who is a working class fuck boy. And yes, he goes through character development, but he is created to be a non-choice. He's a disposable boyfriend and a disposable character, honestly, because he's only interesting through Rose that we understand why she would emotionally cheat on him and then leave. That, 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 that's his purpose. And that is the first black role of merit in the show. And therefore we have our sole two black love interests that got, they get paired together at the end of this series, despite interacting not even once. Horrible, horrible. Treated as disposable people who get to evolve and grow, but it's not for them to end up happily ever after with the person that they care about. So yeah, Martha is sadly one of the characters that falls under this trope, which is especially heartbreaking to watch because she does love and care for the doctor so friggin much and I know that folks say that it's so powerful that she chooses to leave and I agree I love that she does realize it's being treated like shit but my question always is and has always been as I was watching it if Rose and Ten are the end game in in the world that Davies has has created why couldn't Martha have been like Donna a friend to the doctor, be a, a queer woman or a lesbian who's not interested in, in little white twinks. Some of us are free. And by us, I don't mean me, but I mean other, you know, and I want that for Martha. You know, there is this way, like I said, that writers will try to avoid racism allegations by crafting a black character who exemplifies so many unstereotypical behaviors, set up with a healthy family dynamic, you know, in a position of financial success, in an upward mobile job, you know, she's Dr. Martha Jones the next time we do see her later on, which shows that like, she is a doctor traveling with the doctor. Like Martha Jones is a bad ass, cool character. And yet her entire series is about her in a toxic relationship with a white guy who's still in love with his white ex. And having younger doctors has meant a lot of flirtation. And with 10 and 11 especially, we got companions like Clara and Amy and Rose who were also beautiful, tiny white women who are put into these romantic style intimate situations, especially now that, you know, there is kissing and <laughs> on the show, they're all put into this stuff with the doctor. And Martha is the only one treated through the entirety of her run with emotional dismissal. When people hear these racial analysis, they think that we're just kind of pulling it out of the hat. But when you lay it down flat, with the exception of Donna, who is, you know, not interested in 10 and is the closest in age to Tenet, you know, Rose, Amy, Clara are all put into romantic situations with the doctor. And she is the only one, Martha, who is actively rejected and treated as a rebound for the entire of her run. And that sucks. Hello, Editor Princess here. Um, While I was rewatching putting clips together, I ended up 
multiple times watching the scene where Martha is looking so wide-eyed at the doctor while he's talking and like, what am I missing? Is it right in front of me? Something really close. Staring me right in the face and I can't see it. Rose and now. A friend of mine, Rose, right now, she'd say exactly the right thing. talk about media analysis and talk about shows and relationship representation is that who you are paired with who how you are seen romantically absolutely does matter in terms of what it projects out into the world and I think that a lot of writers want to do this kind of egalitarian thing and don't necessarily think about the romantic politics of stuff and you know love is love and whatnot but we got to keep it 100. There is still some racial politics about who is placed on these dating platforms, who is seen as desirable. And when you have this beautiful black Arabic woman being placed at the bottom through just the way her series plays out, it's fucking annoying. You know, even if we don't go to the extreme of like, it's racist, um, which there's a solid argument that there is underlined uh, microaggressions for, just the reality of the way that it plays out is so frustrating. And so my hope is by addressing the fact that Martha is most known for this romance and the way the romance plays out is fucked up is not to to place a morality on anything but to ask people to just keep this in mind when i look at fandom's treatment of of black women who are put in positions of romantic dalliances and the way that they're treated it just makes me feel like ugh, like no wonder it's so hard and i and i and i sometimes think about my own anxieties about relationships my own anxieties about being chosen and I think especially with pick me culture saying that you want to be chosen has gotten this weird tint to it but I think the underlying thing is you know when you know the dating politics of the world around you it's hard to be vulnerable it's hard to put yourself out there and when I see Martha be so vulnerable be so clear with how she feels and seeing it be so dismissed, not just by the doctor, but by the fandom at large. It just kind of reminds me of why it's hard to be vulnerable in the first place. But anyway, that's something I'll share with my therapist after I'm done editing. Is that you can tell that these writers don't think about it that way. They don't see it that way because they're just thinking about like this one tiny interaction between these two characters. They're like, oh, it's just Martha and the doctor. It's just these two characters. It doesn't mean anything else. And the reality is it wouldn't mean anything else if there weren't so many other examples of this happening across multiple other shows. And the reason why they felt comfortable doing this is because they felt like, even if Martha got the short end of the romantic stick, they felt like, oh, if they make her a strong black woman who is this middle-class doctor, that it would still be a win. That because she was checking all these other boxes, they didn't think about the labor in a racialized way that she was being made to go through in that show because that's not the priority. But that's not what made me start watching the show because I'm used to black women being mistreated <laughs> in sci-fi and fantasy. No, it was, we'll get there. Now then, I'm Dr. Martha Jones. Who the hell are you? In series four, we get Donna Noble officially as a full-time companion. She does make an appearance briefly in a previous episode, um, at, which starts her character journey as, you know, selfish character turned awesome. And I love Donna. Donna is great and lives in the high ranks of awesome redheads named Donna Multiverse. She's a great companion for a lot of reasons. Catherine Tate's a great comedic actress and just meets 
Tenet's energy tit for tat. And because her companion wasn't Gaga over the doctor, that element isn't there. They're just gonna be like fun platonic friends. Her working class skills are used really well throughout the series. So it's like great to see someone's secretarial skills have a lot of relevance to like an alien plot. And throughout all of her appearances, she grows into this really awesome character. And it's nice to see a woman in this kind of role getting to just have fun and be cool. Donna is unmatched and I'm glad that Catherine Tate is returning because her and Ten have the best relationship together and I'm so glad that it's gonna be brought back. As I said before, Russell T Davies is returning to Doctor Who for the latest incarnation, What is Dead Will Never Die. And him returning as showrunner is interesting because I, have always had mixed feelings about his run because I feel like some of the more standalone episodes would be excellent. Sometimes series two, in my opinion, is like the weakest of the whole thing. And I appreciate the camp a lot more in retrospect. Like I don't cringe as much when I revisit those episodes, but I just feel like the finales would leave so much of the imagination with the exception of like, uh, the, the season three one. So like, when he left, I felt sad because I liked what he had done and I liked the characters that he created. But I remember at the time feeling like another showrunner could only improve things, right? Right? I'm your daughter. Huh? When I binged through all of series one to five, it was so exciting to prepare to watch series six because now I could watch series six with the knowledge of, it, of everything that had come before it. And overall, I feel like for all the issues I may have about the way it ended, series five of Doctor Who was super strong, especially because it's a whole new team. When Matt Smith joined the show, he became the youngest person cast as the Doctor at the time. My allergies are acting up, so I'm sorry I sound even more nasal than usual. He is this goofy, tall, big head who, very much has a lot of the like old man in a young man's body aspect of the doctor which is really good and i think smith is some of his best acting in this role like he's so able to waffle between childish delight at something and like deep set generational rage which is really good and his first companion in the series is amy pond played by karen gillen i heard you on the radio you called for backup i was pretending it's a pretend radio but you're a police woman i'm a kissogram and when we first meet amy it's as a young girl who's actually gillen's cousin and she is this young girl that he runs into during his travels and he promises to take her on adventures he's drawn to her for a number of reasons but the main one is that she has this weird mysterious crack in her wall so he's like this crack is cool you're cool little redhead kid i'm gonna go and be right back so he goes into tardis thinks he's coming right back around but he has missed a lot of time and amy is now a grown adult and in this weird relationship with rory in a similar dynamic to the rose mickey thing amy is both drawn to 11 which is the number of mad smith doctor and rory but unlike before she ends up with rory this in part happens because of the character of river song who is Stephen Moffat's like pet character in a lot of ways that originally appeared in the previous series uh, with 10. You're doing a very good job acting like you don't know me. I'm assuming there's reason. Oh, fairly good one, actually. And returns in this series to become a more full-time flirty love interest with Eleven. Hi, honey. I'm home. And what sort of time do you call this? River Song is a doctor slash professor who is in a, at the time, undefined relationship with the doctor, but the big thing about their relationship is that they keep meeting out of order. The day's coming when I look into that man's eyes. My doctor. And he won't have the faintest idea. Stephen Moffat really likes the time traveler's wife. Uh, and so he very much based River Song 
on that whole dynamic. And I will say this, this is a hot take, I know, but I do love River Song. I've always loved her, mainly because of Alice Kingston. And I love Amy and Rory's development over the years. Um, their relationship really gets to grow and both Amy and Rory grow as characters together. And Rory is a good guy. And I think that's the biggest difference between the way Rory is written and Mickey is that you're supposed to like Rory. And I really love Matt Smith as the doctor. I think that he is really charming and engaging and fun and also obnoxious when he needs to be. Like, I loved him so much that I didn't even realize that he didn't have eyebrows. So series five on a high. And then series six came in. You're ready to pop, aren't you? <laughs> I do fundamentally, as a critical thinker, understand that River Song is a Mary Sue underogatorily. But the way that the reveal of her story happened and who she really was, was exhausting. Ooh. But you and I, we, 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 uh, yes. <laughs> River was a character that was always set up to have a difficult way because you have this character who is so smart so fun so cool, in the relationship with the doctor like canonically the doctor's wife to a certain degree and that makes her the most special and so there really wasn't much that Moffat could have done to not make River like truly truly a problem but making River Rory and Amy's child is one of those things that almost is too on the nose about like the doctor's relationship to his companions that he literally through his companions creates his wife. Even though River is so attached to the doctor for a myriad of reasons, this means that she exists because of him as well. You can let me do this. If you die here, it'll mean I've never met you. Time can be rewritten, not those times. Not one line, don't you dare. And the way that they choose to have Rory and Amy raise River, but not because they make her the best friend. It's just, it's so convoluted. You named your daughter after your daughter. It took me years to find you two. I'm so glad I did. Just thinking about this conclusion because I was so ride or die for like a story arc is so lit callbacks 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 be careful what you wish for girl because at the end of this run I was praying for episodic give me someone's face stretched out again bring the face of Bo back why can't she just be another time lord from a different dimension but even that's not what broke me oh no I got disrespected in my own city showrunner Stephen Moffat is a divisive figure in the Doctor Who fandom. He wrote six episodes during the RTD run of Doctor Who and they are regarded in many circles as some of the best in that era which is why when he was tapped to be showrunner it was really exciting. His run has been largely known for its interconnecting plots that was a big change from the RTD run which again was more exotic nature in the show with like at the end being like a big plot thingy he also was a lot more doctor centric you know while the companions were once you know these normal people who were called on a hero's journey and evolved and transformed through the interaction with the doctor the doctor kind of became like the focal myth making person and the people that he was drawn to were these extraordinary so you had amy with her crack <laughs> where they're crying and Clara with her like per persist element where she just keep coming back and much like RTD there is this inability to understand how to say goodbye to a companion that can't just be traumatic like it has to be so extreme because you just don't leave the TARDIS but I felt like with Amy and Rory there was an opportunity Amy Come see this. What? There's a gravestone here for someone with the same name as me. Angels Take Manhattan. Angels Take Manhattan is the official send off of Rory and Amy Pond. It takes place in series seven. And I rewatched the episode before writing this section. And I will admit, I did cry rewatching this episode because there's a lot. The Weeping Angels, which were created by Moffat, are like the perfect creature to kind of explain the Moffat degradation because Blink 
is a terrifying episode of television. It was the perfect self-contained time warp stuff that works in these little bursts that's so good with Doctor Who. They are quantum locked. They don't exist when they're being observed. The moment they are seen by any other living creature, they freeze into rock. But listen, your life could depend on this. Don't blink. Don't even blink. Blink and you're dead. They are fast, faster than you could believe. Don't turn your back. Don't look away and don't blink. But then as you keep using them, they get to become more and more ridiculous. And Angels Takes Manhattan has a weeping angel statue of liberty. And I can't, I can't. I always wanted to visit the Statue of Liberty. I guess she got impatient. And I think in a lot of ways, Angels Takes Manhattan isn't even a bad episode. In some ways, it actually highlights the best parts of Amy and Rory's character evolution. <laughs> Husband, run! Both as individuals, but also as a couple. Like, Karen Gill is working her ass off this episode. You know, she's been carrying franchise on her back for a very long time, girl. And I'm just like, first of all, shout out to her. Nebula, you're doing great, sweetie. Brody, careful on reentry. There's an idiot in the landing zone. You know, it's a great examination of the doctor dealing with aging companions. And with River showing up, we get to see how their relationship is now somewhat equal for the first time in this series. And they know that they're each other. They know that they're married. And they get to just be able to be fun and play with each other. And like, Matt Smith's chemistry with Alex Kingston as River's song is like so spicy. Thank you, sweetie. I know your team players and everything, but she'll definitely kill at least the first three of you. Well, the first seven easily. Seven, really? I'll oh, wait for you, honey. Stop it. Make me. Yeah, well, maybe I will. Is this really important flirting? Because I feel like I should be higher on the list right now. Even the underlying tension of the book that River writes and the spoilers in the book is really good because like it ties into River really well. It has the whole timeline dynamic. What sucks is that this is a closing chapter for Amy and Rory that is done in a way to make maximum trauma for the doctor. There is nothing satisfying about this story arc and how they are forced to leave that is good for Amy and Rory. In ATM, <laughs> uh, Angel Take Manhattan, Rory goes to get coffee, is touched by an angel, lol, and is flung back in time. When everyone catches up with him, we see him die as an old man, which sets his death as a fixed event. It's canon now, and the only way to fix it is to create a paradox. If Rory got out, it would create a paradox. What is that? This is the angel's food source. The paradox poisons the well. It could kill them all. Oh, this whole place would literally unhappen. It would be almost impossible. Loving the almost. Which happens when Rory decides to sacrifice himself. Amy decides to, to sacrifice herself with him, believing in his gamble, believing that it will work and things will just reset. And it does reset. Except one angel survives at the last second, touches Rory, sending him back in time. And they can't go back to get him because of the paradox. No, we can just go and get him in the TARDIS. One more paradox. Would rip New York apart. Well, that's not true. I don't believe you. Mother, it's true. Amy decides she's gonna go be with Rory because it'll send her back to the same time allegedly and allows herself to be also touched by an angel and is flung back in time where the doctor is like begging her not to says goodbye to river uh slash melody because that's that's you know that's her that's her government name and the problem here is the paradox the brothers paradox this thing that moffat puts into the story to give it this Moffat gravitas and it don't make no goddamn sense. Timey wimey stuff. The fact that the doctor can't go back in time to Manhattan to get Rory. Sure. I can understand that. But the fact that he, a time vortex traveler, can't go back to any other point between where they get set back in time and when he die, 
is bananas. It don't make no fucking sense. Especially since Amy and Rory have their memories of traveling with the doctor. They can do literally, and have to eventually get in contact with River anyway. So they can literally do so many things to get in contact. Like literally River has a device in the episode that lets her go travel through the mess. Well, how did you get here? Vortex manipulator. Less bulky than a TARDIS. A motorbike through traffic. So like, what are we talking? What? What's going on? V, I did not see her on the sheet. If two plus two was four, right? And five plus five is 10, okay. What I the fuck is this? I think if there was ever a companion that had like perfectly had the time to leave, it was Amy. And like, even, even if I bought this idea of them getting yeeted back in time and that's being the issue the problem is is that it just doesn't make sense and Moffat's own comments don't help because when he explains it it still sounds like bullshit New York would still burn the point being he can't interfere here's the fan answer this is not what you'd ever put out on BBC one because most people watch the show it and just think well, there's a gravestone, so obviously he can't visit them again. But the fan answer is, in normal circumstances, he might have gone back and said, look, we'll just put up a headstone and we'll just write the book. But there's so much scar tissue and the number of paradoxes that have already been inflicted on that nexus of timelines that it will rip apart if you try to do one more thing. He has to leave it alone. Normally he could perform some surgery. This time too much surgery has already been performed. But imagine saying that on BBC One. Okay. They don't want the companions to have any way to come back, which is just silly like here's the thing you are evolving a show that's been on for decades yes only martha has ever chosen to leave change the trend why do we spend all this time making this character have this thing this power these all this specialness if they can't even have autonomy and how they decide to leave especially because on top of it all you have the scene of like the doctor going back to go hang out with little amy so i'm like so so my brother you can't go back the show was progressing to this point where it was just trying so hard to like impress me and wow me and shock me that it forgot that I like I want to be entertained I want to enjoy these characters and I want when their ends happen for it to be satisfying oh, I always rip out the last page of a book and it doesn't have to end I hate endings but that was 2012 and it is 2023 over 10 years ago. I'm told! I beg your pardon? Oh, I'm like the Crypt Keeper! I did kind of want to go back during the Capaldi era, but I have this condition known as chronic aversion to Clara syndrome, so I missed a chunk of that. I ended up watching the Husbands of River Song episodes because, duh, I love my wife. So. Assuming tonight is all we have left. I didn't say that. How long is a night on Derillion? 24 years. And Bill was a companion that was of interest to me, but I will admit I was nervous about seeing another black female companion and she was only around for one series. So I just kind of was like, I'm not gonna let myself get invested. I did want to go and watch Jodi's run, especially because I loved her on Attack the Block, but I just wasn't interested in seeing more brown companions around a white doctor, especially because I felt like from what I was hearing, there was stuff being done that was good, but I just would often think like, who's in the writing room? Who is being presented? And until the doctor is a person of color, I just wasn't interested and they heard me. And then Chudigawa got cast. Black folks have always joked about not being able to travel through time. Even Martha talks about it. So getting a black doctor who can do that is so exciting. So I'm going in with some tentative 
optimism tentatively because I want this show that has been able to evolve and change to continue to do so and I'm hoping that I'll be able to be full-fledged Doctor Who fan once again outside of magic although I am crossing my fingers that we get a really good Martha Jones card no matter what the color is I will be playing it and I will be competing oh and for those that are interested speaking of magic I forgot to say at the top for those who care I will be at MTG Vegas I am going to be there as a creator which is really exciting I will be bringing a bunch of commander decks and one CEDH deck just one yeah I'm excited to be back in Doctor Who but I'm also just I want as the franchise and the fandom moves forward like it's great to see people loving Martha now but I think it's not enough to just love Martha now it also means acknowledging why Martha was being set up to fail why Mickey was being set up to fail and how that matters because if we want showrunners to do better they have to understand what they did wrong and fandoms also need to be able to put these things together and like it's fine you don't want to like mickey don't like mickey like i don't like mickey either i think he's a really shitty boyfriend yes he deserved to get dumped but it's not about him as an individual it's about the dynamics that are set up around it like dislike the character but also understand the lens in which a larger conversation can be broached that's what really matters. My doctor is black, his pants are tight. I'm going on adventures now. Nebula is the online streaming service that is home to some of your favorite creators. Members of Nebula get early access to content creators' work such as myself, Extra Credits, FD Signifier, and many others. It also includes exclusive originals like Lindsay Ellis' new video about Jurassic Park. It's very good and oh god, I'm one year older than Jurassic Park. That terrifies me on a visceral level, but Whatever, what you gonna do? With your subscription to Nebula, you'll also get access to Nebula classes and podcasts. My own voice appears on the only podcast about movies, speaking about both The Last Voyager of the Demeter and Polite Society, both great movies, by the way. I also have an edited videos on Nebula, something that's gonna be happening more and more since YouTube is determined to censor words no matter the context. I'm not bitter. Thank you to Nebula, and if you click on the link below for my channel, you'll be able to see my most recent video on Nebula about the very disappointing queer relationships in the new Charm series. Because when we only get two witch series every couple of years, we need sapphic levels to be much, much higher. If you set up using the link below, you will support me directly, get access to both Nebula and Nebula classes for 40% off annual plans, which is as little as $250 a month. Thank you so much and thank you to Nebula.